it's wonderful to have you, Alessandro Bava, with us from tomorrow to EcoCore. Um, Alessandro is part of the 89 Plus project, which Simon Caste and I started, mapping the generation of artists and architects, uh, scientists, practitioners born in 89 or younger, and having grown up with the digital generation. And there are so many links of Alessandro's project to, to Cedric and Lucius that we thought, with Stefano, it would be wonderful to have Alessandro here as part of the Tomorrow section. Of course, also the idea of a magazine, Tomorrow being a magazine. Also, I'd like to mention here Joseph Grima's magazine, because you have here on the back wall, uh, if you all look back, you have uh, Joseph Grima's magazine. We call it the Grima machine. It's a content machine, and whenever you have time in the course of the next two days, you can see this magazine in the making. But now we're going to talk first about Alessandro's magazine and then about his pavilion, because he's also got a pavilion here in Venice, outside the Ciardini, the Airbnb pavilion. A very warm welcome to Alessandro Baba. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Alessandro, I thought it would be good that you would maybe begin by telling us a little bit about EcoCore, because the environment and ecology are very central in Lucius Burkhardt's thinking. He often talked about, you know, Joseph Beuys and uh, the project in Castle of Beuys. He often talked in his own work, of course, about, you know, the environment as a sociologist. He very early, uh, already in the 60s and 70s, focused on those themes. Uh, and in Cedric Price's work, it appears also a lot. For example, his very, very late project, towards the end of it, where he wanted to inject oxygen lungs into the cities. Can you tell us a little bit about EcoCore, how it started, and the kind of vision behind it? Yeah. Well, EcoCore started in a kind of very lazy moment of my life when I started thinking about what is the theme that is interesting but I'm kind of suspicious of. So I think ecology, you know, I was always interested in it, but I thought that it kind of had a moment in which it was very radical in the 60s, as you said, Cedric, Cedric Price, Lucy Burkhardt. But then today it's kind of very unattractive and very badly communicated. And I think we experience ecology more when we buy our shampoo than in any other way. Because it, you know, when you buy your shampoo or you buy your groceries, you're always confronted with this idea of imminent death and your decisions are always gonna have an impact of, on the end of the world. So, so I thought, because also like around me, I, I saw that you know, artists and architects were kind of engaging in an interesting way with ecology but there was not a place where this became like a consistent agenda. So in 2010, while I was in New York, and as I said, I was being very lazy, I was going to parties and not doing much, so I, I decided to start this magazine on an issue that I was, I didn't know much about it, so I decided to do the magazine to kind of assemble ideas and content around uh, these magazines. And this is how it started, and it was kind of, it's, the magazine is kind of, the, the form it takes is uh, appropriated content, commission content, and, you know, it has been a great experience to, to involve people on, on this subject. And can you tell us maybe a little bit about some of the content lines in the magazine so far? So well, the, the, the magazine has had a penchant for, well, all kind of conspiracy theories about ecology, all kinds of, uh, we, we, I also published like interventions from Michelle Obama, uh, there's an, there was an issue about food where like we had Carlo Cracco's photographs along, alongside um, uh, different architects, architecture, uh, visual essays and different artists I commissioned like uh, to do different series and poetry and all kinds, I mean it's very rich I would say like it's every issue because it's two, one issue two was printed and the other two were released on XYM which is an online publisher of, uh, art, of a friend of mine, Marley Mio, who's an artist. And so the PDF ones really were very extensive. They, t they became like 300 pages kind of documents. So they were kind of endless. One was about dolphins, um, you know. So there's very, very, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a wealth of things in this magazine. Now Gustav Metzgott, an uh, uh, artist, uh, London-based artist who has actually, he's now in his late 80s, has addressed issues of ecology uh, in a similar way like Burkhardt very early on. And he actually told us the other day, which now gave us the topic for the next uh, marathon, that we basically should not talk about ecology because no one wakes up if we talk about ecology. Yeah, but we exactly. should actually use the notion of extinction because he believes yeah. if we talk about extinction, uh, it will have a, more, a bigger impact. How do yeah. you see the kind of echo calling to extinction? Well, I mean, as I said, like, Igor kind of was always tapping into that. Also because 
as I said, ecology, sustainability are kind of super unattractive. I mean, when you see them, especially in architecture, I mean, sustainability and ecology always dealt with as, as kind of like certificates or, you know, something bureaucratic. It's not something that, you know, it's embedded in the way you, you design a building or it's kind of, it's completely removed from contemporary practice. So I think, I mean, the, the issue of extinction is definitely, um, is definitely interesting because that's what ecology is about. I mean, that's the kind of terrifying part of ecology, to be honest. And that's, it's, in a way, in the last issue, for example, which is about God, so it's about all kind of spirituality linked to nature. Um, you know, there is this idea that ecology is kind of a new religion. It's kind of the only thing that brings us together on the pretense that nature is this kind of shared you know, it's kind of, it's, it's there and it's something that we can all relate to and it has uh, elements of spirituality in that sense. Well, it's very scary in a way. Now let's talk a little bit about the pavilion because uh, we always thought, you know, given the fact that uh, the Swiss pavilion this year uh, has so much to do with uh, actually dialogues which go beyond national boundaries, of course the dialogue between, you know, Lucius Burkhardt and Cedric Price, but then many of the participants from all over the world. So we thought it's also interesting to make links to other pavilions, and one of the collaborations is with your Airbnb uh, pavilion. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit uh, how to find it, you know, <laughs> what are the ideas behind it, what's the vision? Yeah, well, the Airbnb pavilion started as a kind of guerrilla idea, so we wanted to be present at the Biennale because we thought the, the main Biennale is about kind of the eternal elements of architecture. We wanted to do something that was about now, was, about, was, was trying to show that architecture is alive. And so basically we, we, uh, we decided to do uh, a pavilion about this connection between the internet and architecture. And now the internet is really affecting architecture in a very deep way because we thought that in the past 20 years the internet has only affected architecture in a kind of uh, metaphorical way. But we think that, you know, Airbnb really tackles the core the core business of architects, which is the house. And the house has really changed in, in, uh, since, um, since uh, Airbnb because, you know, it's not anymore, the house is not anymore just uh, an intimate place, but it's, very, it's, displayed, it's displayed, displayed online and it's public, it's part of your social profile. So, um, in a, and also it's become a, a place of production and reproduction. So it's not anymore an intimate environment. And I, we think, this is for architects a great potential that needs to be explored also in terms of uh, from the point of view of design because it really transforms, uh, it really opens up the house because the way we design houses today hasn't changed since uh, the Renaissance. So, you know, Airbnb really opens up the ha housing as a typology also. So you can think that, you know, with Airbnb, you rent out your extra space in the house and that needs to affect architecture. And I wanted to say something about Cedric Price because in a way, Cedric Price, you know, his vision for the Fan Palace, in a way, it doesn't become relevant in a way for architects so much, I think, but it's really informed the internet more than architecture. In a way, that kind of transformation, that kind of uh, adaptability has really transferred to the internet, and Airbnb is really, in a way, in a, an effect of that movement. So you could say that architecture right now is not so much, we're not so much thinking about how it can change, but because we know that people change People adapt to architecture. Architecture doesn't adapt to people. So that's kind of that's kind of the threads that were there. So we commissioned 25 architects, 25 artists to uh, to do work around housing. So we showed 25 projects by architects that we thought would say something interesting about housing today. And then we commissioned some arch artists to kind of uh, inhabit this this awkward uh, blurred line between uh, between art and interior design. And then. And then some others just came to Venice and did site-specific site installation in the house, in the houses that we rented. And we also have been living there. Also, yeah, we've been staying in the jacuzzi mostly. And I invite you all to come have a bath in our jacuzzi. And can you tell us, uh, maybe as a last question, so that everybody knows how to find it, where oh, is well, the Airbnb pavilion? We're going to have these flyers around. So you can find it on www.airbnbpavilion.com slash location. It's near Palazzo Grassi. Alessandro, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Grazie.